Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And a very good evening to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today is June 25th, and uh, we have a great guest uh, this evening. Um, now, uh, before I get into anything and inviting the guest on and so forth, everybody get your seats. Hello, chat room. Um, as you well know, I don't participate in the chat room because you guys are just you're always talking and you distract me with your great questions. Speaking of questions during the show, if you have any, please uh, go ahead and put those questions into the, the chat room. Our beloved and wonderful expert producer, Thomas, will pick those questions up and give them to us at any time during the show. Um, and we will ask all of your questions uh, to the guests as well. We'll take phone calls uh, the second hour. Uh, that's in, uh, generally what I do. Um, so. And you all know the drill. I'm sure you do. Um, again, good evening and thanks for joining us. This is going to be a, a wonderful show. Uh, my guest, Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, that's a mouthful. Uh, she is an expert in a field that is, uh, that I think you're all going to find very interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk right now. We've covered it. Uh, I'm, hundreds of hosts are covering it. Um, the whole ET connection. The whole idea that we're possibly being visited, all of it, um, you know, last week, Friday, uh, by the way, I wanted to catch you up on the Dosey fire in Arizona. It's 70% contained today. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your prayers and your quantum thinking because uh, even uh, those who live out there, and I want to say hello to Corey and Glenn. Thanks for the information and the photos uh, and, and the documentation. We're going to put together a very precise article on what happened in Dosey because this goes beyond fires. Uh, there's something very interesting going on, and we mentioned that last Friday. So um, we're going to put some evidence together for you. I might even go out there and do some soil sample testing. I'm trying to get that done right now, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely catch you up on that. And in the UFO video uh, taken out in, uh, at the East Eddy Ranch by James Gilliland, who you all love, uh, we've got another one we're going to be putting up for you, even better than the last one. And the, so far, the last one hasn't even begun uh, to be debunked which is great. Uh, everyone admits that what they're seeing is not not from this world. It doesn't appear to be anyway. Um, and there is no explanation for it. I think it's pretty hardcore evidence, if you, if, if you don't mind me saying. Uh, as, as you well know, I've been out to the ranch. I've seen this activity with my own eyes, not through a telescope, not through night vision with my own eyes. So it's just a really fascinating uh, phenomenon. And uh, I find it to be absolutely wonderful. Uh, my guest, as I said, Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. It's, it's such a pleasure. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, PhD, is a global specialist in exoconsciousness, a concept she originated to define the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of human consciousness. This is fascinating. Her work is informed by leading-edge research in ufology, cosmology, consciousness, and quantum science. Wright is dedicated to developing extraterrestrial consciousness to accelerate our species' transition you know, we've all been talking about this evolution of our species, of humanity. Our species transition as a space-faring race, living beyond the bounds of our brains and our planet. Her main theme of human consciousness as it relates to and is influenced by the extraterrestrial presence examines objectifying the ETI presence, holding evidence at arm's length. That's interesting. The traumatic response of fear and disbelief and a gradual acceptance and integration that we are part, possibly a rather in, insignificant but essential part of a multitude of conscious beings. 
Now, um, Dr. Wright has a book, Exo Consciousness, Your 21st Century Mind. And it details exo consciousness as a means to awaken and develop an evolved extraterrestrial world view with accompanying advanced abilities. Wright is in Washington, D.C., representative for Quantrek, founded by scientist and Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. This international team of scientists and researchers combine science and spirituality with quantum physics and cosmology. Uh, Quantrek is dedicated to the research and application of, of the quantum hologram and zero-point energy. On the fa- uh, faculty of International Metaphysical University, Wright teaches Introduction to Exoconsciousness, and in 2005, she taught one of the first ufology courses in the nation, Extraterrestrial Reality, at Scottsdale Community College right here in Arizona. So I'm just uh, thrilled to have her on the show this evening. Uh, we're going to focus uh, on 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 her quest, which is uh, her research. How does extraterrestrial contact affect human consciousness? It's a very interesting question, and I can't wait to get into this discussion. Uh, welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks, Roxy, and thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. All, all your kind words. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, just off the bat. Um, how did you arrive at this wonderful research that you are involved in? And when did that begin for you? What happened? Did something change for you in your life uh, that caused you to start looking in this direction? Well, as I write about it in my book, Exoconsciousness, I've been an experiencer since I was a child. So I came into this field with an awareness of the extraterrestrial per- presence from actually early childhood. And then as I got a little older, I got uncomfortable with it. So I just nicely asked to be not part of the contact for a while. And I went on and lived my life and moved through adolescence and into college. And it just seemed like in college, I began to pick it back up. But then after college and graduate school, I got married, had had my had a big family you know, got busy with my home, my family, my career. And then um, when I lived in Arizona, around 2005, I had a a reawakening um, epiphany and experience that was very, very vivid. And I began to go back and kind of, I pulled that piece of tapestry in my life forward again and started to look at what exactly was happening and UFOs and extraterrestrials, what had happened to me, what was my experience, what did it all mean? And, of course, living in Phoenix, as many of your listeners do and as you do, you're very much in tune with what's happening in um, in Native American um, experience, I'm talking about star visitors. I started to get into science. And probably one of the most important things that happened to me was I moved from Scottsdale to Fountain Hills, Arizona, and I became dear friends with um, Dr. Ruth Hover. I don't know if she was ever on your show, or if you. No, know I don't think so. I, what's the last name? Her last name's Hover. H O V E R. She ran the longest running experiencer group in the nation. Out of oh Fountain my God! Hills. Oh no! You know what? I did have a, a, a Ruth on recently, but it wasn't Hover. But I would love to meet her. I would love to meet well, Dr. Ruth. Well, she passed Hover. away, oh, unfortunately. Oh, oh, but she gosh. was my mentor and my teacher, and she worked with directly with John Mack and his peer group. So. Mm. P-E-E-R um, group that he organized at Harvard. So I was um, I, I was able to tap into that um, very small core of researchers who were looking at what extraterrestrial experience meant and what happened to people. And Ruth had this incredibly vast library. And I, I would just go to her house. She'd give me another book. I'd go home. I'd read it. I'd go back. I'd get another book. And I just, I just kept broadening my knowledge. I, I began to um, remember what had happened to me. I began to awaken my, um, what I would call extraterrestrial abilities. So, you know, we can talk about that later. 
but as that as that moved on, I decided, okay, I've read enough books, I've talked to enough people, I've gone to enough experiencer groups, now I need to teach a course. So I sat down and I put together a curriculum and I sent the curriculum to um, to Scottsdale Community College. And I actually asked a friend of mine who's a professor at Boston University, I said, okay, how do I put together a curriculum request? Because I wanted to, it to look really good so the school would pick it up. So he helped me out. And um, so I put together this curriculum, went in and talked to them, and they had me teach the course, which, long story short, it it was successful, but the university decided that the college Costa Community College decided not to have the course run after our first um, time because I think a member of the community called up and was kind of irate about the fact that the county funds were being spent on um, such a course. Hmm. So it only ran once, but that was good because that was a groundbreaking thing to happen. And then at that time, I began to meet with a few other people that were also um, – teaching courses in ufology. And then literally one morning I was lying in my bed around 2005 and I had done all this work. At this time, I was a single parent raising three of my four adolescent children. You know, I was raising three children at the time who were adolescents. So I was really busy. I was you know, keeping my feet on the ground and being a single parent. And yet I was doing all this amazing research at the same time and meeting these people who were helping me along the way, just like Ruth. And literally the phrase exoconsciousness was given to me in my mind. And I knew that this was to be my field of work, that I was to, to go, um, out and research consciousness and find out about how my extraterrestrial experience formed my consciousness, how it advanced my consciousness, and then also work with other people. And so today, this is where I am, and I'm still hard at it. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Um, you know, so you actually really were the first to use the phrase uh, exo consciousness. Right. I made. I. I. I would say made I made it, it up. <laughs> right. I created it, but I didn't sure. really create it. Was given to me. So. Right. I, I understand. I understand when you pull something from the the quote unquote ether. Yes. So yes, yes. Of course. Of course. Um, and how how fabulous. Um, so what does it mean? What is exo consciousness? What What exactly? Uh, you were given the, the 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 phrase, the name, the word, and uh, did you, when you were given the word, did you already know what it meant? No, no, I did not. What I did was I started again to sit down and start to research consciousness and contact, mm. and I began to look at what the broad themes were, and that's when I came up with the definition of. The extra that exo consciousness is the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of our human consciousness. In other words, those come from our extra extraterrestrial origins. So it's based on a theory that we are a seated people and a seated race, as many you know have written and spoken about. Sure, um, and 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 it, and that's very controversy as uh, versial as well. Do you find that in two thousand, oh, the last decade, let's say, do you find that more and more people are open to the idea that we are a seeded planet, or do you find that uh, people are very close minded to that? Well, I think because in anything, there's a there's a segment of the population that's very open to it, and um, you know, there's a lot of people um, that have been raised with Von Danigan and and his work and, you know, Sitchin. And if if you're religious and you read scriptures, whether they're the, the Vedas or the or the Old Testament or the or the Christian scriptures, you're gonna see a lot of talk about angels and extraterrestrial presences and and um that that presence is there, you know, whether or not you believe that the origin is there, I think as 
the whole ufology um, field begins to open, that you just can't go around and look at nuts and bolt hardware all the time. At some point, you have to make the leap to the fact that, oh, gee, there must be a presence behind all this. And I think slowly we're getting to that. And as that unfolds, we're going to begin to see that um, that we do have an intimate link with extraterrestrials. And goodness, we we act like extraterrestrials. We're cloning ourselves. We're we're putting computers in our brains. We're we're doing um, um, consciousness uh, propellants and navigation. Our, our military is doing that. We're looking at you know, living longer lives. We're, we're doing things that the extraterrestrials spoke of doing. So that's who we are. And we're, we're literally mirroring who possibly our originators were. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty complex, I think, for most, especially because a lot of religious dogma is based on we were, you know, created by God. And there's this, uh-huh. you know, image that comes with that and has for quite a few thousand years on the planet. And so basically when you sort of evolve your thinking, and I can hear this in what you're saying, uh, out of this one God, you know, we've been the planet has been warring, <laughs> you know, in the name of this one God. No, our God's right. No, our God's right. No, it's our God. No, it's our God. And so, you know, at the end of the day, that's interesting enough as it is who's got the right God and all that. You know, it takes you down a completely different road uh, with the never ends, never gives you the, the answers. And then to find out the possibility of what you just said, Rebecca, which is not even a stretch. It, it, it is so right on. At the same time, very difficult because even personally myself, you know, I'm concerned, for instance, with genetically modified organisms, let's say, you know, GMOs, changing the DNA, changing how we grow food, um, artificiality in weather, in, uh, in everything, this whole artificiality coming into our world and being presented mm-hmm. and biotechnology and, of course, like you mentioned, computers and then the idea that we can actually, you know, become. We're probably using more of our brain than we ever had. As time seems to be speeding up conceptually. I mean, look at all the stuff that we interact with with technology. It's all day. Cell phones, this radio show is all about technology. We wouldn't have this show if it weren't for technology. Computers, laptops, uh, iPads, iPods. I mean, our whole world is is really uh, all about technology today. And if you don't have it, you're really sort of in uh, outside or off the grid, if you will. Uh, everything's operating in, in, and intercepting and having a relationship with technology. So what would you say to the idea that if we are imitating them, uh, they being E.T., um, uh, is, are we at a da- dangerous cusp? Because of this yes. as well. Okay. Yes, we are. I, I, I think we are. I think that's why extra consciousness and, and disclosure is so, it's, it's absolutely critical at this juncture in our, in our human development. Um, you know, it's, it's okay for us to say, oh, you know, I can raise my consciousness and I can do yoga and meditate and I can change my, my genome. I can change my genetic code. We're all oh, that's fine to do, but the rub comes when you start talking about, you know, technology changing your, your genetics. So, you, you know, we, we can't walk away from technology at this point. So how are we going to integrate it into our lives and, in, and into our worldview and into who we see ourselves becoming? And that's why I just feel that... Exoconsciousness has got to be talked about because it does look at computer enhancements. It looks like it, it looks at futuristic evolving that we're doing with computers and, and with electromagnetic forces. And they, they just were talking now about 
um, regulations for computer games and how they affect people's minds and trying to regulate that. I mean, we've got a, we have a lot on our plate as a as a world as a planetary culture to deal with what we're doing to ourselves and why we're doing it. And if we need to go this far or if we could do it in another way. Yeah, and there seems to be some sort of um, dichotomy there and a, and a total yes, paradigm shift, right? Yeah, I, I get that. I totally get that. It's very polarized. But it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't right. have to be polarized. It can right. be something that we move forward in a healthy way as opposed to having a war about it. I get, uh, the, yes, agreed. I get the disclosure part because I think that is the theme in, in, in a lot of subjects right now and genres because what is going on behind the scenes that, that we as humanity, let's say, are not being told about. I think that on the top of the list is the military and the militaries of the world also dealing in, um, you know, going to the moon, going to Mars, etc., you know, into space, let's say, going out into that playing field, if you will, and not telling us uh, what they're doing, what they're developing, and testing, experimenting on us as a planet without us know- knowing. And um, as far as technology goes, I think that it gracefully presented itself. I think that we all just sort of found ourselves one day using technologies of all kinds all at once, you know, laptops, cell yeah, phones, that's a good, wireless. That's a good illustration. Right? And so with that in mind... And 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 really, uh, we're all self-taught in it. You know, it's like yeah. it's not like we went to school to learn how to use a, a cell phone, and so um, or computers. I mean, we fumbled. I think the first couple of years, and but the technology wasn't as gigantic as it is right now. So we're just learning as we go, and it just pushes us and pushes us. But I think it's the secrecy. Behind what you uh, what you're terming disclosure, um, the secrecy, the experimentation, uh, we have the right to know what we're choosing in this. And mm-hmm. do you deal with that aspect of this? Absolutely, I deal with it. And I, I actually, I, I attended Steve Bassett's Citizens Hearing on Disclosure at the Press Club. I live in D.C., so mm-hmm. I was I had a great opportunity to to uh, attend that for the five days. And one of the things that becomes very quickly obvious is there's such a love-hate relationship between ufologists, because it was primarily ufologists that were speaking, between ufologists and the government. Because most of the information that the ufologists get, you know, Grant Cameron, Richard Dolan, you know, whomever, they get from the government or they get from whistleblowers. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, you know, you, you're keeping secrets, and yet these, this whole facet is getting, making a livelihood, hopefully, I hope they're making a wonderful livelihood off of, you know, uncovering what, what the government has kept secret, and yet, in many ways, it's not as secret today as it was before. And so what I'm doing with exoconsciousness is not only looking at what the government has, what the military has, but I'm also looking at what, what did the religious texts tell us about contact and extraterrestrial presence? Because I maintain that through most of human history, the religious leaders were the ones that um, facilitated extraterrestrial contact. And I, I hope to right on this soon, but, um, you know, as, as I just look at the evidence, it's pretty obvious that the high priests and, and the religious leaders were the ones who communicated with the ET. So what does religion have to tell us about, about ufology? What does um, consciousness studies have, have to tell us, whether, you know, Hindu, Buddhist, um, anyone that's going into Greg Braden, and anyone that's exploring consciousness, what does physics have to tell us? about ufology. So there's, it's such a vast field that you can't just always be worrying about what the government's keeping secret, because when you do that, you just ignore this whole plethora of information that could be giving you just the answer that you need. 
That's wonderful. And I think you're absolutely right. When you are focused on any concept that uh, you feel the government is hiding or corporations are hiding, you're right. You sort of go down a tight rabbit hole, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like you have Mm -hmm. blinders on almost. So you're right. And there's this all, like you said, a plethora of information available to us um, that we can start connecting the dots with. Um, And I think one of the big things, and I'm sure you'll agree uh, right before we go to the break here, I'm sure you'll agree is is our intuition tells us a lot. Yes. Yes. And it also leads us where we need to be going. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, I, um, yeah, you, you, you I, know, do you think, our, and again, welcome to the show for you. I see some of you are just tuning in. Uh, the guest this evening is Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. We're having a great conversation. So just jump right in. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them to the chat room. So, Rebecca, is humanity having some sort of amnesia or, or, or are we being blocked by uh, remembering who we are? Or is this an evolution that has nothing to do with memory or is it all of the above? Well, I think the whole concept of memory, I I write about that in my book. You know, we used to think memory was, you know, one part of the brain, and and then we discovered through um, the scientific research that it's memory is all over the brain. So I I, honestly, what I I know uh, about consciousness, I, I literally believe that you can't block someone's intuition. I mean, that's their consciousness lies not only within our brain and the way it's made up and on a, on a subatomic level that, um, that different uh, researchers have talked about, but consciousness also is without our body. So we all, we always have that, that link to consciousness and it all depends on how, how we choose to access it. I mean, I have protocols from my life that I have chosen to, to develop because it heightens my consciousness. And I think that part of our extraterrestrial nature is learning to live in a conscious field outside of our body. So we not only go in an extraterrestrial way into space and live in an an interplanetary life, but we first start to practice that when we begin to acknowledge the fact that we live in a consciousness field that we can access outside of our body. So we're sort of in an interconsciousness realm where it's almost like the playground kindergarten for moving off planet. I mean, Edgar Mitchell, when we went to the moon, one of the most um, important things he did was he had a, he had a telepathic experiment that he performed that he writes about in his book. And, and he came back to earth convinced that, you know, ESP is, is a, a real phenomenon. Mental telepathy is a real phenomenon. And, and you have to have that grasp of what I call exoconsciousness or you, your space venturing or the movement of humanity into space won't be done the same way if we don't bring our consciousness up to speed with what we're doing te- technologically. Isn't that interesting? I, I've I've read some uh, very valid, um, oh, how do you say it? Um, excerpts, uh, 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 hypotheses on um, uh, the idea that we've actually. I'm trying to I'm trying to formulate the question because it just came off off out of my head, and now I can't find the words. Sorry, excuse me, Rebecca. Um, with Atlantis, that we did the same thing in Atlantis. We our technology got beyond our consciousness, and it uh, apparently uh, is what ended us right, as Ed- a civilization. Casey, right, Edgar Casey, Atlantic University. I mean, the Edgar Casey Institute is still, you know, working from the information that he brought in from what we now call the Akashic Records. Yes. And, um, Laszlo, I, I don't know if you followed his work, but he yes. he talks about the the uh, zero point field, the the A field, the Akashic field. That that there's um, an electromagnetic field, there's a gravity field, and then he has identified the fact that there is an Akashic field. That's just the energy of information that we can access. 
And you know, it's interesting that you say when you're when you're talking about this, just the vision I'm getting in my mind. It is interesting because it's almost like the computer and being able to communicate with people all over the world via, let's say, social media networks. It almost feels like that's a baby step, like the 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 external version of what we yes. can experience. Right? Isn't that interesting? Yes. Well, That's what you're really talking about is cloud computing. Sure. Which has been around, you know, the concept of cloud computing, I believe, has been around since the 70s. So, um, you know, actually, I noticed today that um, Grant Cameron is writing about the whole cloud computer, c- computing that was um, researched by ARPA here in D.C. and um, how they, they got the idea that, you know, there is a, a consciousness cloud, but you know, going back to Laszlo and people like that, I mean, Hinduism and Buddhism have talked mm. about this for, you know, centuries, that, you know, consciousness ev- evolves in this manner, and that's how kind of the hologram of consciousness operates. So um, I, I think that, it's, once again, it doesn't have to be either or, because you look at what Grant's doing in terms of consciousness and the historical reference of, how our technology is working within trying to define um, consciousness. And yet, you know, he's, he's going to the government, he's going to the military, just like, you know, Dolan and Joseph Farrell go to the military and the government to find out, you know, what is the, this covert government that exists. I mean, all that research, I could not be doing my research without their research. It, it's mm-hmm. all so important. Mm-hmm. It's all it's all integral and it's all intrinsic. So yeah. it's it's one yeah. big picture. C- correct. Um, you know that that leads me to another question. Man, you're really you're you're really uh, opening my mind to a couple of things here. Um, that, that so thank you for that, Rebecca. You know, thank you. we're when we're on like even social media networks. I, I've I've noted to my friends, you know, on the phone that. When I get online, I can feel the energy of the people who are on the threads and talking to me, though I've never met them, right? (laughs) Right? And I can feel like I almost predict what they're going to say next. And, oh, you know, you took the words right out of my mouth, that kind of thing. So, and I've said this for a couple of years that it's really bizarre. It's, it is very similar to just hooking into consciousness. Uh, you, You know, and I think that. I think that you're right. I, I I agree with you. I think. I mean, I'm having an aha moment that the consciousness and and the computer uh, or the internet, I should say, it, it is one. It is all one. We are all in one consciousness, and this is just relative to um, us sort of experiencing it in an, in a, in, a, in a way that we can make it tangible. And for, and what you're saying backs up what Laszlo says. Because right? he says that it's a field just like gravity, just like you feel gravity, just like you feel ele- electromagnetics. You can feel this Akashic information field. It has a pulse. It, it has an energy to it. It's, a, it's like, you know, it's like the computer has a subtle body that we can, that, that we can experience. I mean, we're learning so much right now, and we have to have technology to help us experience experience this because it's taking us into ourselves as well as outside of ourselves simultaneously it's so important absolutely and it's and i think it's a very exciting time i really do yes. Uh, yes. One thing that I can see very clearly, and, and I bet you can in your travels as well, is that the planet, the globe, it, it, we're, we're all connecting to each other now. Well, we're, yes. we're, we're a decade ago. That just wasn't possible. Not the way it is now. So it yes. is a very cool thing. Now, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're an experiencer, and I, I, I want to tap into that a little bit, um, if we could. Uh, your personal uh, experience uh, with uh, E.T., I imagine. I, I am a personal experiencer, and mm-hmm. I, 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 my experience has started about three years old, wow. and I have very, very conscious memories of up until like 10 or 11 years old of beings in my bedroom, beings communicating to me, and it's interesting. I, I had vivid memories of going to, I call it star school. I don't know, somebody else might call it something else, but I have vivid memories of going to start after I came into earth then being sent to star school almost like as a refresher course because 
I really believe that when we come into this life, we, like Carolyn Mace talks about it, we sort of go through the valley of tears and the, the yeah. veil comes across us and we really forget who we are. And it's all almost as though that happened to me as a child and then I got picked up again and, and, and thrown into star school and said, okay, you need to, now you, we, we need to help you remember all of those things that you forgot because as you move through your life, it's going to be so important for you to remember these things. And, you know, nothing could be truer in my life. I mean, when I think about it, it's just, it's really quite awesome that led me into this work. Right. And, and, and I can see that where it's, it, it, it makes sense to look back and, 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 and connect with that experience. Um, it was that, was that a scary thing to do or was that really natural for you? No, I was always very, very calm. I mean, I, I never had any, well, I suppose I, I take that back because there were times as I got older that I got afraid. Okay. But as a, as a young child, I was never really um, afraid of what was happening to me. And I think as I got older, I, I, you know, peer influences. And I think I was just kind of embarrassed and and frightened by it. Because by that time, you know, as I moved into the later years of elementary school, I, I knew more about what, what was going on in life. And then it was interesting. I went through a phase when I began to remember in detail what had happened in my childhood, I went through a phase where a couple of phases I wrote about in my book where um, I was, I had a lot of orb visitation. I had a lot of like um, eat different ET races coming to visit me. And then I had this wonderful experience for really quite some time where I, I would be in bed at night and the ETs would literally press three-dimensional symbols through the, my ceiling of my bedroom wow. to take me back to school again. Oh, that's, oh, that's, you know, oh my gosh. You know, so many people have told me about their childhood experiences. Um, I've met quite a few experiencers, as, sure. ma- as a matter of fact, you know, and, and I'm not quite sure, are, are we, do you think, <laughs> between me and you and I don't know how many listeners at the moment, but do you think that we're all experiencers? Yes. Oh my yes. gosh! Yes, I do. I, I oh have to tell you, I, I love this story because okay, go for it. Actually, this is one of the reasons why I'm teaching um, introduction to to exoconsciousness at IMU at International Metaphysical University because I really want to start to form a, a community. You know, whether it's an IMU or it's in my work or wherever, where people, you know, are just another place, kind of like what Ruth Hover gave me. Mm-hmm. She gave me a place to be who I was, where I didn't feel like I was weird or had my kids looking at me going, oh, mom, you know, she's so whacked, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do with you? <laughs> and it just, it was just such, I, I needed that. It was a wound for me, literally. And I, and so then I, I became a hypnotherapist and a coach and I still do that today, but I remember distinctly opening the door in my office and looking at a young girl one day, I took one look at her and I thought, oh my God, you are such an extraterrestrial. I mean, she just, I just knew it. She had, she had the whole vibration. And so she comes in and we began to do her work, which had nothing to do with ETs. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I've I've got to, I've got to say something to you. And she goes, what's that? She was in her early twenties. And I said, you know, you look like, you You seem to be an extraterrestrial to me. Does that mean anything to you? And she goes, no, that doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not an extraterrestrial. And I said, oh, okay. So we continued on. I just dropped it. Because a lot of times with my clients, I sort of float things by them like a little boat. And I said, you know, if it floats good, if it sinks, that's fine too. And so I just, I just let it go. And we're into her session about a half hour. And she looks at me and she goes, well, I just thought of something. And I said, well, what's that? And she goes, well, you know, I'm originally from Utah, and I come from a Mormon family. And I said, yes. And she said, I remember my, now that my mom told me that when she was pregnant with me, that the local doctor wanted to abort me. 
And my mom said, there's no way you're going to abort me, this, this baby. She said, she just put her foot down. And she goes, I am keeping this baby. And the doctor's adamant. He's like, we have to abort this baby. It's, wow. it's not well. We have to. And she goes, my mom told me that the ETs came and visited her every night and worked on me. And right before I was born, they came and told my mom that I was healthy and that she could give birth to me now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that a good story? Wow, I love it. I love it. And and, it's like, and oh, I'm not an ET. Well, yeah, you are. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's just wonderful. Now when you um uh teach, um what what exactly? I mean, obviously you 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 do a lot of different things, but what what do you, what do you what's your future in this, you know, in in exoconscious? And do you deal with people one on one who remember or have had experiences? You mean and- in terms of my classes? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And what I do you have, say? Um, Go ahead. I have people that have had all kinds of, um, you know, in this class I'm currently teaching, you know, yeah. near-death experiences, people that are that have very, very vivid um, experiences with extraterrestrials and, you know, high psychic abilities and people that are, you know, very interested in um, making a living you know, working in, in film and that sort of thing with um, with extraterrestrial and UFO information. Mm-hmm. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's a, a wide variety. But people who take these courses take it because, you know, they've, they're have they at a heightened awareness that sure. this is who they are. Mm-hmm. But I, I love that part. I mean, one woman sent me information that, um, that a friend of hers had done recently where he started taking pictures of the ectoplasm of his breath. Wow. Oh my golly. And it, it has symbols and, and oh, you're animals kidding. Oh and my gosh. people and images in it. And I'm like, I keep thinking, oh my golly, oh my golly. That goes back to you know, all the work I've been doing with Kundalini and, you know, raising your Kundalini yes. through your breath. It goes back to all the religious, you know, talk about I'm the breath of life you know mm-hmm. does our breath it does our breath are we breathing in and breathing out the akashic field oh my gosh <laughs> we may be the ectoplasm around our body may be our akashic field and we are literally breathing it we're sucking it in, and we're we're inhaling it, and we're exhaling it, and we're inhaling it, and we're exhaling it. And as we breathe in and out that information, we become advanced consciousness. And that's what Jesus and and Buddha and the gurus in Hinduism. That's what they were all talking about. The Old Testament people talked about that. Oh yes, Breath that's is that, integral that's everywhere to religion. On, that's yeah. everywhere on the planet. Even in where I'm from in Hawaii, all the kahunas. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Right? And, and they all call the the uh, Westerners the shallow breathers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Breathe. Because we breathe. don't suck in the ectoplasm like that. That's they do. right. And that's why in, in 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 anytime I'm uptight when I'm home, you know, my friends will say, Alo <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it means come on, it. breathe in, breathe out, you know. And it, it but it, you're right. It's 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 in, in every uh, indigenous culture always yeah. about the breath of life and all, all the and rest here of it. Here we're holding this this vast storehouse of information inside our bodies. And we're just now, but not really just now, because if religion knew it all that time, then, you know, that's knowledge that's been around quite some time. We just, you know, 400 years ago with the whole, you know, separation of science and religion, we we lost all that esoteric metaphysical knowledge. And we started to, you know, say it was irrelevant and irreverent and you you name it. Do you think we lost it, or do you think that it's it's been suppressed? I think both. I, I think both. Mm-hmm. I think it's been suppressed to, you know, certainly to a great degree. Religion, you know, suppressed it itself because it, it, it went on a different, you know, when that deal was cut 400 years ago, 
science got the material world and religion got consciousness yes. and spirituality and unfortunately hasn't done anything with it <laughs> <laughs> in the Western world. But I what think hasn't done anything you know, for me. <laughs> but certainly in the Eastern world, you know, sure. I, I can't say the same because I, I mm-hmm. feel that um that really when you look at um there's an, an Indian group called Art of Living that I became acquainted with here in DC that um, has have gone into prisons and people that have been traumatized and they just do breath work. And You're reading my mind about the traumatized. Uh, yeah, and, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, I deal with a lot of people who deal with people who have been traumatized and how does that affect us as a planet? Oh, it's, it's uh we as a traumatized species, mm-hmm. um, it's interesting because when I was in Phoenix, I I was introduced to Lee Gertis. Have you interviewed anybody that, that does brain state technologies? I don't think so. Okay, brain state technologies was founded by Lee Gertis in Scottsdale, and he worked with another man called David Berselli. Have you heard of David? No. Oh, David Berselli. Another another person is um, Tiller. The um, the physicist in Scottsdale, Tiller, T I L E R. Well, that's that name sounds familiar, yeah. but you're you're talking about local Arizonans in, in yeah, Scottsdale. Yeah, these are all local people. Yeah, they all yeah. live around and the Scottsdale area. I don't know area. any of these people. I need to meet well, them. Yeah, they they all. Um, I I've worked a lot with with um, especially with Lee, and um, <laughs> and that's where I I began to learn about trauma and a lot of that I learned about trauma came from this is so funny a doctor whose name a, a, a scientist whose name is Dr. Scare <laughs> oh my <laughs> <laughs> so funny anyway what a so, coincidence <laughs> in a great so Dr. Scare did a lot of the original research on what happens when animals are traumatized and he found that when animals are traumatized and they're not allowed to move, that literally that trauma scar deepens into their brain and causes much greater harm to them than if the animal is allowed to run and, and literally shake off the trauma. And so David Berselli took that knowledge and took it a step further and, and started working with um with veterans who were coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and he would go out and rent these big warehouses and put these these troops through literally yoga positions. You know how in yoga, when you're holding a position and your body starts shaking? Oh, sure. He, he would put the vets in yoga positions, teach them how to get their body to shake, and that would start to relieve their PTSD. And David went all over the world studying how other cultures coped with trauma. And so then, from that, those two men with, with um, Teller and, and um, we're actually training Teller and Dr. Scare and, and David Rosselli then began to work with Lee. Well, what happened to Lee Gertis was he was literally almost beaten to death with a baseball bat one night. He'd gone to like a homeless supper, shelter thing at his church, and he was getting in his car in Northern California, and he was literally almost beaten to death with a baseball bat. And he had worked in computers and done that kind of that out, work in the algorithm where on Amazon, if you want if you want this book, then you may probably also want to be a, buy these other books. I mean, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, computer algorithm that he came up with. So he started to heal, and he started going out and looking at um, cultures like um, Hindus and Buddhist priests that meditated for, you know, um, years on end and got their brain waves. And then he moved that into a protocol called um, brain optimization or brain state technologies. It's there in in, uh, Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. And he literally came up with an... uh, a quantum-based treatment where your brain looks at your brain. Your brain looks at your brain through the computer and heals itself. Wow. And it's done through 
harmonics and sound and this whole database of, you know, thousands and thousands of clients that he's, that he's worked with. He's, he's just done, I mean, I can't say enough about the phenomenal things that he's done. Once again, you know, you're looking at technology that changes people's lives. Yes. But it's a technology that acknowledges that consciousness is beyond what's just in our brain and that our brain is also operating at a quantum level. Yes, it, it, it makes so much sense. I know that people, are, again, are very fearful of, for instance, the, the quantum computer or the, you know, the human brain becoming one with the computer, being able to operate a computer without even needing yeah. the physical computer or an implant, a chip, what have you, just terrified. And I, I think the reason why people are terrified is that they will lose themselves in it and won't know that they're human anymore. How did humans, you know, may I ask before we move forward on this, how did humans get traumatized? Well, I think any time, what happens in trauma, Roxy, which I found this, this was like one of those aha moments for me. When we're traumatized, literally, our brain bleeds and makes a scar. Mm. So what Lee found out was that he could go, Lee Burtis found out was that he could go in and look at the trauma scar bleeds that your brain has had and the blueprint that they made in your brain. And he could tell you the diseases that you will probably come up with in your life. Oh, my goodness. And so what he did was he started working on this protocol so that what happens when you're traumatized is is your brain bleeds and makes a scar. So when you get in an emotional process or an emotional feeling or an emotional experience, you know how people say, I feel stuck? Yeah. I can't move forward. They're stuck and they can't move forward because their neural pathway keeps going up to that trauma scar and getting stuck, literally. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's amazing. So, so what Lee has been able to do is, is to work with this protocol so that we begin to form new neural pathways around those scars and we can move forward. But you know, it's not just what Lee's doing. I, I, I had three of my kids had um, eye therapy issues where they had trouble tracking and they had trouble focusing and and just, you know, eye issues. And so all three of them ended up having... And we're back with the second hour with Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright is our guest this evening. And the book is called Exo Consciousness, Your 21st Century Mind. Uh, she's all linked up at thetruthdenied.com. So go ahead and take a look at the links or any other information or contact information if you'd like to get a hold of her or pick up the book. Um, also, uh, I want to thank all of our listeners for keeping us on the air. Uh, we have over 45 hosts at Revolution Radio. We are our number two in internet radio, uh, commercial free, meaning we do not do any advertisements for money. Uh, we don't get paid. We're all volunteers here. So the listeners keep us going and keep these airwaves open for us. So much appreciation. And I want to thank uh, a few of you who wrote in last week and made uh, some donations. So um, we, we very much so appreciate it. And um, of course, give a big applause to the owner, Hawk. There's no one here. Revolution Radio that works harder around the clock and keeping this whole system running and of course all of our producers and all of our hosts for quality program so thank you so much so Rebecca we were just talking you and I um, before we went to the break about your kids and eye therapy right eye therapy is just a a protocol where you exercise your eyes and, and give them certain movements but what happens from from eye therapy is that that your brain makes new neural pathways through eye therapy and your sight is healed and it stays that way. So that was my no, that was my first introduction to the fact that our brain is is not is not something that we're just 
you know, stuck with. And if we have brain impairments, we can't heal them because we can. We can heal our trauma. We can we can heal our our, our vision. And it's it's really revolutionary. But yet again, you know, eye therapy also it has to have technology in order to work. They found that um, in California, they they've gone into school systems and into correctional institutes and found that many, many of the children in these correctional institutes were there because they can't see. Wow. And, and vision is something that you don't know that you can't see. You're just assuming that everybody sees like you see. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and they're, they're, they've talked in the, in the past about actually implementing it throughout the California school system. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, obviously, you know, as a parent, I'm, I'm a real advocate for, you know, these kind of um, possibilities that can, you know, give our children a different life. And I think a lot of ADHD, a lot of trauma, a, a lot of those issues sometimes manifest as visual issues for children. Sure, sure it does. Uh, you know... I would say that, you know, from my perspective and even just listening to you, that there is there is a way to heal just about anything. I think we're we as a species are beginning to understand that um, and run across the information more frequently because of people like you, Rebecca, who are giving out the information, teaching the information, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, exo conscious what the the exo conscious person. I'm imagining right now that we are all that. Uh, that's what our species is, an exoconscious person. How do we become conscious of that? Well, I think part of it is already happening. I think any time, in, in, in my humble opinion, any time you read a UFO book, any time you look up to the heavens, Anytime you watch a UFO type movie, even even if it's violent, I mean you're still moving your perception off planet. You're still moving your perception to the possibility that there are that there is and has been an extraterrestrial presence operative. So all of those kind of experiences are what really pulls us into becoming exoconscious. And then I think at some point, it just becomes a decision. You, you, you just look inside yourself and you say something as simple intentionally as, you know, I'm ready to become exoconscious. I am ready to become aware of the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of my, of my human consciousness. And I think that when when you do that, then things start to happen. You you begin to be led into different ways of opening your consciousness. I mean, for me, one of those pathways has always been yoga. That's that's just something that works for me. And then when I moved from Phoenix to DC, I thought, oh, you know, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do about yoga here. And I went to get my hair done, you know, being a woman, I went to get my hair done. And the first time I get my hair done in D.C., the owner of the salon comes over and starts talking to me. And I told her a little bit about who I was, and not really a lot. She looked at me, she goes, oh, you have to meet Nancy. <sighs> I said, oh, okay. Well, she hands me Nancy's phone number. I ignore it because I'm busy. I just moved. So I go back in, get my hair done again. She goes, did you call Nancy? She comes over and looks at me and goes, did you call Nancy? And I said, no, I didn't call Nancy. She was called Nancy. I said, okay. I call Nancy, and she has become the most fantastic kundalini yoga teacher in my life. I mean, she is literally changing my life through kundalini yoga. I, I, and it, yet it took this woman standing in front of me numerous times saying, did you call Nancy? It's almost like, you know, here I... I think I'm so aware, and obviously I'm not, because it's right. a lot of time for me to call Nancy. <laughs> right, and um, you know, I was going to ask you about that too. You know, for you, your choice is Kundalini Yoga, which is fabulous, and um, for others, uh, it could it could be a number of things. Correct. Um, 
as oh, far as Reiki, sort of, I mean, right, yeah. right, inducing it could be memory, protocol. what have you. Mm-hmm. It could be writing it could, music. Right, it could be hypnotherapy, it could be mm-hmm. art. Mm-hmm. I know mm-hmm. that, that uh, Mia Ferraletto is coming on your show. Yes. I mean, she, she's going to be talking about, you know, all the art and, you know, art and contact and extraterrestrials. I mean, she, she is such a creative, brilliant woman. And you just had Lynn Wallach. I mean, he's a... He's an oh, I love Len. I, I love like, Len. Right. He right. is so, you know, speaking of Len, thanks for bringing him up. He is so easy to listen to. He's like I drinking a, a glass right. of tall, cool water, whatever they say, right? You know, it's just, it, and everyone said that, that, that listened and tuned in and wrote in and said, God, he was just like, you know, taking a nap or something because he, 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 you could just drink him up. He's so easy to listen and, to. And he's talking about such complex. Yes, he is. You know, and he breaks them down. I mean, right. what I got from him, and you, and you'll know what I mean, but when he said, you know, I said, well, what do we do, Len? And he said, we got to <laughs> be like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> And it just, it stuck with me ever since. I mean, if anything I got out of that, which you know, that's just one huge concept anyway, right? And I started telling people for weeks, you got to be like Jimi Hendrix. And they're like, huh? (laughs) I was like, Jimi, he he like turned up the distortion and said, you know, who cares that no one's using distortion and just like, you know, and everybody's like, okay, you all right, Rox? We got to be like Jimmy. But it's it's so cool when you connect to that opportunity that we all have in us. And then, you know, as far as, you know, um, uh, Kundalini, I wanted to go back to that for just a second. What is it, do you think, for yourself is in Kundalini Yoga? Do Do you just like the practice of yoga or is it your good teacher or is that just your comfort zone or what, what is it about uh, Kundalini for, for those who might be listening who want to maybe experience it? Well, Kundalini Yoga, as, as any yoga, it's connected to your chakra systems. Um, that, that, the Kundalini Yoga that I do was um, brought to America by Yogi Bhajan, mm. who um, was given a plot of land in Española, New Mexico. And ironically, when I was... a uh, between my fresh my, my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college, I went out to Española, New Mexico, and worked one summer. <laughs> and here it ends up being, you know, the home of Yogi Bhajan, where he brought Kundalini Yoga to America. I mean, just you know, look at how your life has such synchronicities to it. But um, you know, it talks about the Kundalini rising. It's um, very very connected to you know, the, the base of our spine and the energy that runs up and down our spine. Um, one of my kids um, does kundalini yoga, and she said to me, she goes, wow, it really makes you psychic, doesn't it? And I said, yes, it really does. And it just, you know, it not only opens your psychic abilities, but physically it, it, it attunes you to, to um, energy flows and kind of opens your your um, hormonal and endocrine system to to healthy performance. I mean it's just it's it's almost like a performance enhancing practice. That's that's what I would call it. And I do a lot of work on the computer so I'm in my head a lot and sure. my teacher is so good about, you know, we have to breathe we have to get you know out of our out of our intellect and into our into our body and and ground ourselves and and um, let our body speak to us and you know let go of our monkey mind and let it let it pass through us and I mean we chant a lot and um, you know I'm I was raised in the church my father was a minister so I was used to you know singing all the hymns and you know, the importance of music and vibration in your body. But, you know, you, you go to another level when you start doing the, the Hindu chants. And it's just, it's so beautiful. And I'm, I'm very connected. D.C. just has a very, very large Indian community. That's here. wonderful. So, That's great. Yeah, it's been really fun to, to get in touch with that, with that community and all the beautiful people that live here from India. And it's just, I, I just, it, for me, it works. You know, maybe right. for someone else, 
that's not their their pathway. Well, I, you know, it's interesting because there there is someone listening to the show right now that really needed to hear that um, they're having blockages and they're knowing they're an experiencer as well, and they're also um, really wanting to just let go, and they've really been practicing and struggling and I just that's why I kind of wanted you just for that one person um, because I, I think that yoga would be good for that person so thanks for explaining that I really appreciate it now what do you mean by um, also like the role of the physical body and the human antenna can you talk about that for a little bit there's actually a woman I, I haven't read the book but she wrote a book called the, the human antenna where it's, it's 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 basically you know talking about the fact that we all we when we think about consciousness, humans in the Western civilization usually think about brains. I mean you know like Obama's brain initiative or whatever. We you know whenever we read um, medical articles about consciousness, they all they all talk about the brain. And in fact, it's so consciousness is throughout our body, and that's what you get in contact with when you do a practice like yoga. You get in contact with the fact that, you know, there are conscious centers in your body. The heart is, you know, a huge conscious center. In Kundalini Yoga, one of the biggest consciousness centers is your navel center. So um, I I live near Annapolis, so my, my husband and I go up to Annapolis every now and then and you know, you just you see the Naval Naval Academy up there, and I just always have to laugh because in Kundalini Yoga, I mean, you know, the Naval is so important. That's what, you know, that's one of the the entrances to this Kundalini energy opening in in your body, and and so much of us, you know, you know, we we look at our culture, and you know, what do people complain about? They complain about what's that Philo sect or whatever it is that they take. Because their stomachs hurt, right? You know, that's your that's your navel center. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's your digestion. That's mm-hmm. that's what's really feeding you the bread of life. You know, you're you have blocks with the part of your body that represents the bread of life, and it's not just the breath of life; it's the bread of life, and and that's that's all talking about our navel centers. And there's a beautiful picture that, um, I don't know, do you know William Henry? You I don't. William Henry? Oh, no. you'll like William Henry. He's very, very, very interesting. He's kind of a mythologist that talks a lot about um, ancient Egypt and Mary Magdalene and, and um, Hinduism and all like that. He's just fascinating. He, he had a picture one time when I saw him presenting of Kuan Yin who's a, a Buddhist goddess of compassion and love, and she's standing outside Earth, outside planet Earth, up in the heavens, and she has suspended on a string, like a little umbilical cord, a little orb with a human in it, you know, moving them down toward Earth. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, Kuan Yin is the navel of, you know, bringing us into life, and I just thought, oh, so, you know, one image, a thousand words. Sure. Truly. Sure, sure. Um, uh, you know, how are we going to integrate um, psyche, the psychiatric community with exoconsciousness? Um, as you had said, uh, um, viewing the paranormal as normal or acceptable, the norm, whatever, you, however anyone wants to right. say that. Because the, the word normal it has a lot of different meanings these days. <laughs> and most people right. will say, well, who wants to be normal? But you know what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, how, how, how are we to integrate this? Well, how is that going to happen? It, can it happen? It's interesting. About I think it was like 2008. I I spoke at the American Philosophical Association on psychopathology and exoconsciousness. It was such Mm -hmm. a flippant hoot. Um, I you know I was sitting among all these philosophers and psychiatrists and and uh, I'll never forget some man was sitting in front of me prior to me speaking. I was just sitting in the audience. He turned to the guy sitting next to me. He goes. Can you believe some goofball is going to get up here and talk about ET? <laughs> I just tapped him on the shoulder and I went, uh, "That would be me." <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> it was so funny, and it, it was such an eye-opening experience for me because they didn't have the history 
and they didn't have the vocabulary or even the beginnings of an awareness to even talk about it. Mm-hmm. And it, it really kind of brought my feet down to earth to say, wow, you know, John Mack started this. You know, John Mack was such a, at Harvard, are you familiar with John Mack? Yes, at Harvard very much and, so. Okay, yeah, I thought you were. Um, mm-hmm. He's one of the groundbreakers because he really began to take these experiencers and give them these batteries of psychological tests. And then he came out and said, you know, they're all, they're all normal. They're all sane. They're not crazy. And, you know, of course, then, you know, Harvard took him and put him on trial. But, you know, more work has to be done around that. But I noticed, um, I, you know, I've only been in D.C. for two years. So I really haven't moved into that, that medical community here very much. But when I was in Arizona, I had quite a few psychiatrists who contacted me because, you know, I was doing hypnotherapy and healing. I work with a Dr. Ron Peters in Phoenix, who was just a phenomenal physician. And, and they, they wanted to learn more about it because they were having people coming to them and, and talking about, you know, I've had an experience and, you know, and, and they weren't labeling them as crazy. They, they themselves were trying to learn. So I think it's, it's just got to come with time and, somebody making that first step as a psychiatrist like John Mack did and said, you know, I'm going to put these people through the batteries of tests. I'm going to address them like a member of our community would. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to learn from that. Yeah, I think, I think that um, you're right about that, Rebecca. I think that that can unfold fairly quickly. You know, I know yeah. a, a woman who, who practiced psychology in the 60s and 70s, you know, and a very educated woman, wonderful woman, and uh, or was it the 70s and 80s, regardless, uh, for quite some time, tw- over 20 years. And she encompassed all of this, and she also taught mm-hmm. about spirituality and breathing and um, other ways in, in in which to aid and assist another human being, not just through the psychology of it all. And, um, you know, it blows my mind because, you know, how she had to practice, she had to be very careful how she practiced. Um, and this always evolves. You know, it's like the pseudoscientists or the pseudo um uh, anything it, it always it, I would say it becomes the norm eventually I, I it's name calling if you ask me to call anything pseudo or pseudo people call me uh-huh. a pseudo radio host you know <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean uh, yeah. a, a pseudo journalist okay <laughs> you know and and it's like whatever and and but isn't that how anything ever evolves you know what I mean it, it right, just eventually right. steps in becomes the norm and then we just go on from there but science seems to be very uh, interesting deliberately <laughs> sometimes I, I I don't mean to make fun of scientists but shallow and private and really in a box and and not wanting to let go of a particular theory or understanding and I see it you know across the board in 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 any of this stuff so I know that you have such a good outlook and attitude about it so I do think that it's very funny that you were sitting next to somebody who did not even realize that you were that speaker right it was it was really quite funny and I I bet. I, I, I feel that scientists you know just be just the way science has evolved in our culture and the way that, you know, the, treat, the, the church treated someone like Galileo or, you know, the Correct. different twi- trials that went on. I think, you know, a lot of fear was engendered in science early on when it, you know, began to really, you know, take root and move forward in our, you know, kind of our modern culture. And I think a lot of, a lot of scientists do feel actually kind of schizophrenic because sure. of that. And that's only natural. But I, I think the quantum physics, and that's why with my exoconsciousness, I, re- I really want to concentrate on getting, getting the students at IMU to understand what quantum physics is, what it means, why it allows the subjective or a consideration of the subjective, because that's what opens the door to bridging, you know, making those bridges between science and spirituality. When we can start to, you know, have a conversation with a scientist where we're on a level with him or her 
and yet we bring that that the spiritual or that esoteric metaphysical exoconscious ufology information to bear and and it becomes a relevant conversation and that's that's why I, I was so um, fortunate to work with Dr. Mitchell because you know I got to work with scientists I got to talk about science I got I got to learn about the new fields that were opening up so that I could begin to have a conversation because that's where it all starts that's where the schizophrenia starts to diminish mm. That's a, that's a tough one. I, I can I can see where that's a tough one for an average individual for sure, uh, or confusing. Um, but I love what you just said. What uh, you just eliminate the 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 well the middleman. <laughs> you just mm-hmm. take a whole aspect out of yourself at that point. And there is so much in science now to the God part of the brain. I mean, there's a lot of there right. are a lot of different scientific people coming forward now, um, talking about the idea. And I, if I remember correctly, when I was uh, in school, uh, God wasn't a consideration in science. Right. You, you know, a God right. of any sort. Uh, was not a consideration. So the idea that we're even looking in those directions and opening up um, the uh, the the door, all right, mm-hmm. uh, in science, I think that it's fascinating. And then I think you're right about the fear. Uh, I, that was something that I felt the minute I said it, you know, to you, uh, that they, they, they are afraid uh, for a lot of different reasons. Some of them will get cut off of their money. Some right. of them will be uh, uh, ostracized, uh, right. you know, a number of reasons. So, yeah. And we have to support Wait. them. Yes. Well, the other thing that um, you bring up, because you were saying, you know, for the average person, that might be difficult to talk about because – Right away, I started thinking about downloads. For those of you who are just tuning in, and I do see in the uh, the chat room that a few of you have just tuned in, you have missed a really, really good show. You're going to have to catch it on the archives, Uh, but please do continue. Uh, Again, the guest is Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright, and uh, I'm so sorry I had to interrupt you there. We just floated right into a break, Rebecca. That's fine. (laughs) Now... What were you about to say? If I if I remember correctly, you were starting to talk about downloads? Right, downloads. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Downloads are an experience or phenomenon that uh, um, experiencers oftentimes talk about where literally you – it happens differently, but oftentimes I'm told that I'm going to get a download. Oh, or, wow. Or I'll be um, – I confront – like. I'll be confronted with information that I don't understand. I mean, especially like scientific and mathematical information. I'll be confronted with this information, or I have an, I have um, a, someone that I'm supposed to be working with, and I don't really understand their field very well. And I will just, I, I will just be told that I'm going to get a download. And literally, it feels kind of like, I, I don't know, kind of like a binary code almost that comes into my consciousness, like down from like the Akashic field or whatever that we were talking about with Laszlo. I mean, it literally just comes into my, um, the consciousness of not only my brain, but, but into my body. It's, it's quite an amazing thing. So now I've just learned to, um, I request it. I say, you know, I'm having trouble here. I, I don't really understand this. You know, I, I need a download here. But it's, it's something that uh, um, a lot of experiencers talk about um, having. And, you know, a, a lot of us are looking at education today saying, oh, you know, what's going to happen to education? Are we going to end up like the banks where there's, you know, four or five big, big education institutions in, in the world that teach the same subjects that they're all teaching now? You know, are we going to go to um, computer implants where, you know, we get downloaded through a computer information yeah. about medicine or law, you know, some highly, um, highly rote memory kind of um, subject like that would work very, very well in a, in, a, in a database of a computer implant? Or, you know, are we all going to learn how 
to receive these downloads. I mean, I'm probably at like pre-K in this, actually. <laughs> where did it, where do you think the download comes from? I, I just have to ask. <laughs> I, I think that I'm probably accessing some kind of um, field of energy and information on a specific subject and asking to be and asking for that information to come into my consciousness. I, I, you know, when you were describing it, that's exactly what I saw. That's why I asked you. Um, I feel like you're probably right. I feel like you're accessing it from a pool of information. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's like a stream. And but, but if you think about it, you know, you look at religious art. A lot of religious art. And, and sometimes people have this feeling like when they're sitting in mass or they're sitting in some kind of a, a service or they're meditating. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll literally feel images like a dove coming into the top of their head or, you know, yes. a, a ray of light coming. I mean, it's the same phenomenon. It's, it's just that in this situation, it's, it's more concentrated toward a particular information that I feel that I need. Yeah, I think I I think that's I think that's fascinating. Now, did you have to learn how to do that, or were you just did you stumble on it? No, I was taught that okay. by extraterrestrials. Okay. Wow, but that's I amazing. I also feel that everyone can be taught that. Right. So that, we all have that exoconscious potential that we can ask for. It's kind of like, it's probably no different than people that say, you know, before I go to bed at night, if I have a really difficult, challenging issue that I'm handling, then when I go to bed, prior to going to bed at night, I ask for this creative solution to this, and I wake up with a solution. I mean, it's really no different. It's that, but for me, it's more of a, I can do it during night, but for me, it's been more of a conscious um, a conscious request. But in order for that to happen, I, I, I believe that the more you're in touch with the, the subtle body that you are, the, the quantum, the subatomic quantum field that you are, that the easier it is for you to get into that human antenna posture. Sure. That's the antenna, gotcha. Okay, um, that that makes sense. You know, um, we have a couple of questions. One that's actually very relative to what you're talking about right now. Um, uh, the listener is asking, uh, please ask her, meaning you, Rebecca, uh, what she feels about past life regressions. I remember coming from a star system way back yeah. when. Mm-hmm, that's what she said, or he. Right, uh, that right. was the question. Is from White Falcon. So, um, what is that all about? Um, do do you? Um, how do you feel about past life regressions? Well, I, I believe in past life regressions. I, I believe that that's an exoconscious ability to have um, a, 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 a memory or a recall of past events very vividly, as well as as future events, but then you come to hold a whole space-time continuum question and you say, you know, was Falcon living, is, is she living there now in the present or was it really in the past? But, you know, her mind is, is dealing with it easier to call it a past life. But is it really, is she living a, multi, a multiverse existence? I mean, right. I have students in my class, literally, who live multiverse existences and live on different planets simultaneously. Right. And I've heard of this before, and it boggles my mind. It hurts my brain. But um, <laughs> there's so much proof of that as well. Um, right. Uh, that, you know what I mean? Because I've always been a lucid dreamer and um, right. from, you know, little two years old, whatever, I can remember dreams way back. And, I, you know, I've been hopping all over the galaxy. And right. um, so I understand what you're saying. And, and there is so much proof that we're able to do that. But like I said, it hurts my brain because I, I, I can only juggle one ball at a time. Uh, so I think, so I think. So yeah. with that in mind, 
um, somebody who's, and I do get the memory part, that a future memory, because once you step out of the, it can feel like a past. You know, people generally think because if they remember something or see something in a dream or have a recall, they li- uh, generally go to the past, but it could be yeah. very much the future and it's being stored present. just like a memory or the present exactly yeah. oh my yeah. gosh oh my gosh and, and like how Penny Allen talks about it she talks about our consciousness as flowing and our mm-hmm. mind as taking pictures within that flow mm-hmm. so you know like when you take pictures on your smartphone and you can right. move through all the pictures and it's like that's what our mind does our mind encapsulates what's within that consciousness flow and takes a picture of it and puts it into our memory as information. And then we we put, you know, a tagline on it. Oh, this was in the past. Oh, this was in the future. Oh, this was in my dream. Sure. But it's just all consciousness. And does it does it matter? Does it matter if it was in the past or the future or the present? It being that we're in this multiverse, does it really matter? Well, I don't know that it matters, but I mean, as a hypnotherapist, I've done a lot of past life regression on myself and other people. And and I I can say that um, I've had clients that have really struggled with challenges in their life and sometimes just organically under hypnosis, they'll just go into a past life regression out of nowhere. And that, that past life regression helps them solve sometimes whatever that issue is. And it usually is taking place at, you know, a later historical period. Right, right. Um, so, another, I mean, it's so complicated. It's just, it is complicated. Time uh, is yes. very complicated. Mm-hmm. I understand. Um, and I understand it's probably just uh, like anything else. It's a process that unfolds um, and that becomes helpful to the individuals who's maybe struggling with uh, lifetimes of, of, of a repeating cycle, a repetitive cycle, what have you. So um, I, I can see where it's all, and you're right, it's very, very complicated. And once, like I said, you know, where I draw the line is I'm having five lifetimes all in this one moment and that's where I can draw the line right, right there I, right. I'm not going there I, I, I got to handle this one right now you know that's that's how I look at it so it's what anybody can actually accept or embrace or integrate or whatever yes I agree it's very complicated um, another person asks if you have ever seen any Arcturian starships I've seen Arcturians I've not seen the starships okay but and, I have communicated with Arcturians before. And what are they and like? Um, I don't remember exactly. It was back when I lived in Phoenix. I, I kept a lot of journals, which I subsequently, when I moved, I, you know, put them all away. Um, actually, the person that's done the best work in terms of looking at the different races is Michael Sala. He's he's done, I, I teach a lot of the the motivations, that he's come up with for the different races. But I, I think the Arcturians are very are a very evolved race. Mm-hmm. But I, I'd like to say to Falcon that people like Falcon are so important because as we become an exoconscious species, people like Falcon are going to be the people who begin to lead us because they're going to lead us with their interplanetary memories. It's not That's... going to be just Elon Musk and SpaceX or, right. you know, quantum computers or, you know, the latest, greatest um, consciousness hard drive. It's, it's going to be people like Falcon that say, you know, this is what life is like on this planet. I mean, it's going to be all of us together. And I think, you know, we so, we're so we so careful not to step on the toes of the government and the scientists and the military. 
when we ought to all be in a conversation together because we all have such valuable information. What do you and think? It's, really, it's you, our it, responsibility to bring that forward. You're absolutely right. I'm so glad that you said that. You know, how are we all going to, you know, the religion, the exoconsciousness, the uh, medical fields, the un- the universities, the scientific community, uh, NASA, the government, corporations, all of us, uh, 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 ufologists, um, you know, whoever, how are we going to all come together under this one exoconsciousness umbrella? How's that going to happen? I think we have to look at the role models of the energy healers, the people who do Reiki, the people who, you know, talk about energy healing, who do sound healing and energy healing and alternative medicine. Those people didn't cowtail to to medical science but they learn to talk to people in the scientific field and in the medical field, and they move their field forward. They didn't wait for everybody to catch up with them. They moved their field forward and took responsibility for it. I guess really that in my heart is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just be one person who moves her work forward and forms a community where people teach me and and people gather at IMU or wherever they gather and we all learn together and we move our our information forward and and we and we don't allow ourselves to be silenced or belittled or made fun of but we you know we stand up and we're proud of who we are right absolutely and you know I'm I'm going to ask you something um, off the cuff here, and I'm just very curious about what your answer might be, um, because of because of your background and the schooling and the experience, and um, you know you deal in specializing in transformation, self empowerment, trauma recovery, emotional healing, etc. Um, also, exoconsciousness coaching and uh, holistic hypnotherapy. Um, you know, you're you're deep into knowing this. You're you you're very educated. Can you tell me where love fits into all of this? Well, none of it's going to work without love. <laughs> it just doesn't work without love. I mean, mm. love and peace. I mean, reaching that vibration is advanced consciousness. Interesting. That's what advanced consciousness is. It's not about you know. How, let's face it, there's a lot of intellectuals in the world. There's yes. a lot of smart people in the world, and one smarter than the next. But, you know, what it all comes down to is, you know, in my heart, the reason I do this work is because I love humans, and I love this planet, and I love extraterrestrials. That's, that's the reason that moves me forward. Yeah, it drives you, and 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 I believe you. You're very genuine. You come, you you really resonate, and you're resonating right. with the audience. So, you know, um, that's another thing that uh, so many, uh, you know, you'd mentioned Len and some of the other people and Ruth and so forth. The, the resonance is is just profound. It's it's uh, again, it's easy, and and it's very easy to hear you out, and 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 I'm so grateful. Uh, that yeah, there are. I so enjoy people. being on your show. It's oh. been, it's been fun. <laughs> I know. You know, we 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 probably didn't get to cover every little thing, which I always say <laughs> that you're just going to have to come back another time. I'd so love we can to. I'd love to. Some other things, and we're not quite over yet. But you know, you're you have a very uh, magical uh, uh, dedication, I should say, and um, and uh, you're just wonderful to listen to. Um, oh, thank uh, you. Hello? Uh, we lost you, Roxy. Yep, we lost her. She'll be right back. Okay. It's been an enjoyable show. I should. I, I, oh, I know thank that. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I had fun. There she's back. Okay, there I am. Sorry, throughout the show, uh, I, uh, someone's been trying to kick me off the air the entire show, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it didn't work. <laughs> uh oh, we're not here. Yes, yes, I can hear you. You're here. Are we back? You're you're here. Yes. 
Okay, sorry, you, it's it's both of you that I can't hear. Um, I, Rebecca, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. There you are. Sorry, I just keep getting booted okay. off. Um, okay, so Cyberflyer has a question. Uh, what is going to take? What is it going to take for exo consciousness to become a viable, effective social action movement? That's actually what it needs to become, and I'm so glad you brought that up because that's exactly what um, I've been working with Larry Lowe in um, in um, visioning is um, putting together. Um, exo consciousness is a social action movement, and um, you know when when you when you create a social action movement, you really you really build the foundation in in very important with very important um, blocks of love and commitment and honesty and dedication and just really getting up every day and doing your best where, you know, things just kind of reach a tipping point where more and more people feel safe and um, a level of recognition with what you're talking about. I mean, I I went to um, Boston University School of Theology, which was um, the alma mater of Dr. Martin Luther King. And, And when you feel, you know, what he did for civil rights, I mean, that really came from not just him, but it came from an inner recognition within the people that he was he was allied with that you know this change has to come, and I, I think I really believe that exo consciousness is the same kind of movement within our hearts and minds that it needs to to um, to grow as a as a social movement. As a social movement, that that is very interesting. Um... Have you thought of that in that light before as well? Um, tried to encourage people to um, have exo consciousness be a social movement. Well, I have, and I, I think that you know, if you look historically at a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King or in anyone mm. that you know is part of a social movement, you know, just participates in you know Gloria Steinem, you know, in the women's movement, you know. All of these usually have some kind of a tipping point where um, sort of there becomes a confluence of events. Like for Martin Luther King, it was the, um, the, the garbage strike that, that he went out and, you know, walked the picket lines with, 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 the, with the garbage men. And um, I think every social movement has some kind of moment that... Um, is kind of sort of the fullness of time when an awakening can take place. And and that has to do with energy and information and um, the ability for us to respond as humans who want to um, advance in our consciousness, who want to be one with this extraterrestrial presence who want to be a, a peace-loving, like Colonel Corso said in, in his famous Roswell book, you know, the message from the ETs were either you come in peace or you don't come. So, it's it, you know, it's, it's about, you know, stepping into that moment that's so much bigger than I am or exoconsciousness is or or any of us are, but it's the moment that we all are together. And, and I believe that that moment is, is dawning. Yeah, and, and you're not the first. Uh, so many people are talking about this tipping point. And, you know, yeah. I do have a question being that you're in Washington, D.C., um, and, and uh, relative to government. Why won't the government disclose this has been going on, uh, in your opinion, in your observation as well? Well, my observation is, I mean, after, especially after seeing through the five days of, of Steve, Stephen Bassett's, you know, wonderful um, uh, citizens hearing, and the, the government has disclosed, you know, the government has really? disclosed, actually, I think, oh well, yeah, I mean, that's, that makes up the part and parcel of, um, 
uh, you know, all the disclosure that's gone on from the Freedom of Information Act and, uh -huh. the, you know, people coming out of different parts of history that have revealed what's happened. I mean, um, most of ufology is built on government Government that's disclosure. right. You said that earlier in the program. That's right. I didn't yeah, catch it the first time you said it. Um, that's where okay. the information comes through. And I, I think the, the, the issue isn't that the government hasn't disclosed, because I think the government has disclosed. I think, and by that I mean the military and, and, and mm -hmm. the whole you know intelligence community. I, I think what's operative, and I've actually had people within the government affirm this for me in a, in a different kinds of settings, but um, I think what's operative is they are going to decide, i.e. the government is going to decide how and when disclosure happens. And, and they're doing that right now as we speak. Wow, this is fascinating information, absolutely fascinating. I've had Steve on the show a couple of times. Maybe I need to touch base with him again and find out uh, a little bit more about what's going on there, too. It's all just unfolding. We're at the end of the show. It was a fast show. It was a pleasure having you fun. on. <laughs> Thank it was you so fun. much. And I well, definitely so enjoyed your them, and they had me teach the course, which, long story short, it it was successful but the university decided that the college, Costa Community College, decided not to have the course run after our first um, time because I think a member of the community called up and was kind of irate about the fact that the county funds were being spent on um, such a course. Hmm. So it only ran once, but that was good because that was a groundbreaking thing to happen. And then at that time, I began to meet with a few other people that were also um, teaching courses in ufology. And then literally one morning I was lying in my bed around 2005 and I had done all this work. At, at this time, I was a single parent raising three of my four adolescent children. You know, I was raising three children at the time who were adolescents. So I was really busy. I was you know, keeping my feet on the ground and being a single parent. And yet I was doing all this amazing research at the same time and meeting these people who were helping me along the way, just like Ruth. And literally the phrase exoconsciousness was given to me in my mind. And I knew that this was to be my field of work, that I was to, to go, um, out and research consciousness and find out about how my extraterrestrial experience formed my consciousness, how it advanced my consciousness, and then also work with other people. And so today, this is where I am, and I'm still hard at it. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Um, you know, so you actually really were the first to use the phrase... Uh, exo consciousness. Right. I mean, I, I, I would say made I made it, it up. <laughs> right. I created it, but I didn't sure. really create it. It was given to me. So. Right. I, I understand. I understand when you pull something from the, the quote unquote ether. Yes. So yes, yes. Of course. Of course. Um, and how, how fabulous. Um, so what does it mean? What is exo consciousness? What, what exactly, uh, you were given the, the 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 phrase, the name, the word, and uh, did you, when you were given the word, did you already know what it meant? No, no, I did not. What I did was I started again to sit down and start to research consciousness and contact, mm. and I began to look at what the broad themes were, and that's when I came up with the definition of. The extra that exoconsciousness is the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of our human consciousness. In other words, those come from our extra extraterrestrial origins. So it's based on a theory that we are a seated people and a seated race, as many you know have written and spoken about. Sure, um, and 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 it, and that's very controversial as controversial uh, as well. Do you find that in two thousand, oh, the last decade, let's say, do you find that more and more people are open to the idea that we 
are a seeded planet or do you find uh, that caused you to start looking in this direction? Well, as I write about it in my book, Exoconsciousness, I've been an experiencer since I was a child. So I came into this field with an awareness of the extraterrestrial presence from actually early childhood. And then as I got a little older, I got uncomfortable with it. So I just nicely asked, to be not part of the contact for a while, and I went on and lived my life and moved through adolescence and into college, and it just seemed like in college I began to pick it back up, but then after college and graduate school, I got married, had had my had a big family, you know, got busy with my home, my family, my career, and then um, when I lived in Arizona, around 2005, I had a, a reawakening um epiphany and experience that was very, very vivid, and I began to go back and kind of, I pulled that piece of tapestry in my life forward again and started to look at what exactly was happening in UFOs and extraterrestrials, what had happened to me, what was my experience, what did it all mean, and of course, living in Phoenix, as many of your listeners do, and as you do, you're very much in tune with what's happening in... um, in Native American um, experience, talking about star visitors, I started to get into science. And probably one of the most important things that happened to me was I moved from Scottsdale to Fountain Hills, Arizona, and I became dear friends with um, Dr. Ruth Hover. I don't know if she was ever on your show. or if you No, know I don't think so. I, we're, we're, yeah. What's the last name? Her last name's Hover, H-O-V-E-R. She ran... The longest running experiencer group in the nation out of Oh my God. Oh, no. You know what? I did have a a, a Ruth on recently, but it wasn't Hover. But I would love to meet her. I would love to meet Dr. Ruth. She passed away, unfortunately. Oh. Oh, But she was my mentor and my teacher, and she worked with directly with John Mack and his peer group. So. Mm. P-E-E-R um, group that he organized at Harvard. So I was um, I, I was able to tap into that um, very small core of researchers who were looking at what extraterrestrial experience meant and what happened to people. And Ruth had this incredibly vast library. And I, I would just go to her house. She'd give me another book. I'd go home. I'd read it. I'd go back. I'd get another book. And I just, I just kept broadening my knowledge. I, I began to um, remember what had happened to me. I began to awaken my, um, what I would call extraterrestrial abilities. So, you know, we can talk about that later. But as that, as that moved on, I decided, okay, I've read enough books. I've talked to enough people. I've gone to enough experiencer groups. Now I need to teach a course. So I sat down and I put together a curriculum and I sent the curriculum to um, to Scottsdale Community College. And I actually asked a friend of mine who's a professor at Boston University, I said, okay, how do I put together a curriculum request? Because I wanted to, it to look really good so the school would pick it up. So he helped me out and um, so I put together this curriculum, went in and talked to them. Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And a very good evening to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today is June 25th, and uh, we have a great guest uh, this evening. Um, Now, 
before I get into anything and inviting the guest on and so forth, everybody get your seats. Hello, chat room. Um, as you well know, I don't participate in the chat room because you guys are just you're always talking and you distract me with your great questions. Speaking of questions during the show, if you have any, please uh, go ahead and put those questions into the, the chat room. Our beloved and wonderful expert producer, Thomas, will pick those questions up and give them to us at any time during the show. Um, and we will ask all of your questions uh, to the guests as well. We'll take phone calls uh, the second hour. Uh, that's in, uh, generally what I do. Um, so. And you all know the drill. I'm sure you do. Um, Again, good evening and thanks for joining us. This is going to be a a wonderful show. Uh, My guest, Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright. That's a mouthful. Uh, She is an expert in a field that is, uh, I think you're all going to find very interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk right now. We've covered it. Uh, I'm Hundreds of hosts are covering it. Um, The whole ET connection the whole idea that we're possibly being visited, all of it, um, you know, last week, Friday, uh, by the way, I wanted to catch you up on the Dosi fire in Arizona. It's 70% contained today. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your prayers and your quantum thinking because uh, even uh, those who live out there, and I want to say hello to Corey and Glenn. Thanks for the information and the photos uh, and, and the documentation. We're going to put together a very precise article on what happened in Dosi because this goes beyond fires. Uh, there's something very interesting going on, and we mentioned that last Friday. So um, we're going to put some evidence together for you. I might even go out there and do some soil sample testing. I'm trying to get that done right now, but uh, we'll we'll definitely catch you up on that. And in the UFO video uh, taken out in uh, at the East Eddy Ranch by James Gilliland, who you all love, uh, we've got another one we're going to be putting up for you, even better than the last one. And the, so far, the last one hasn't even begun uh, to be debunked which is great. Uh, everyone admits that what they're seeing is not not from this world. It doesn't appear to be anyway. That uh, People are very close-minded to that. Well, I think as in anything, there's a, there's a segment of the population that's very open to it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people um, that have been raised with Von Danigan and, and his work and, you know, Sitchin and if if you're religious and you read scriptures, whether they're the the Vedas or the or the Old Testament or the or the Christian scriptures, you're going to see a lot of talk about angels and extraterrestrial presences and and um, that that presence is there. You know whether or not you believe that the origin is there. I think as the whole ufology um, field begins to open that you just can't go around and look at nuts and bolt hardware all the time. At some point, you have to make the leap to the fact that, oh, gee, there must be a presence behind all this. And I think slowly we're getting to that. And as that unfolds, we're going to begin to see that um, that we do have an intimate link with extraterrestrials. And goodness, we, we act like extraterrestrials. We're cloning ourselves. We're, we're putting computers in our brains. We're, we're doing um, um, consciousness uh, propellants and navigation. Our, our military is doing that. We're looking at, you know, living longer lives. We're, we're doing things that the extraterrestrials spoke of doing. So, that's who we are, and we're we're literally mirroring who possibly our originators were. Right? Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty complex, I think, for most, especially because a lot of religious dogma is based on we were, you know, created by God, and there's this, uh-huh. you know, image that comes with that, and has for quite a few thousand years on the planet and so basically when you sort of evolve your thinking and I can hear this in what you're saying uh, out of this one God you know we've been the planet has been warring (laughs) you know 
right. in the name of this one God. No, our God's right. No, our God's right. No, it's our God. No, it's our God. And so, you know, at the end of the day, that's interesting enough as it is who's got the right God and all that. You know, it takes you down a completely different road uh, with the never ends, never gives you the, the answers. And then to find out the possibility of what you just said, Rebecca, which is not even a stretch. It, it, it is so right on. At the same time, very difficult because even personally myself, you know, I'm concerned, for instance, with genetically modified organisms, let's say, you know, GMOs, changing the DNA, changing how we grow food, um, artificiality in weather, in, uh, in everything. This whole artificiality coming into our world and being presented and biotechnology and, of course, like you mentioned, computers and then the idea that we can actually, you know, become – we're probably used um, – and there is no explanation for it. I think it's pretty hardcore evidence if you, if, if you don't mind me saying. Uh, as, as you well know, I've been out to the ranch. I've seen this activity with my own eyes, not through a telescope, not through night vision with my own eyes. So it's just a really fascinating uh, phenomenon, and uh, I find it to be absolutely wonderful. Uh, my guest, as I said, Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. It's, it's such a pleasure. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, PhD, is a global specialist in exoconsciousness, a concept she originated to define the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of human consciousness. This is fascinating. Her work is informed by leading-edge research in ufology, cosmology, consciousness, and quantum science. Wright is dedicated to developing extraterrestrial consciousness to accelerate our species' transition you know, we've all been talking about this evolution of our species, of humanity. Our species transition as a space-faring race, living beyond the bounds of our brains and our planet. Her main theme of human consciousness as it relates to and is influenced by the extraterrestrial presence examines objectifying the ETI presence, holding evidence at arm's length. That's interesting. The traumatic response of fear and disbelief and a gradual acceptance and integration that we are part, possibly a rather in, insignificant but essential part of a multitude of conscious beings. Now, um, Dr. Wright has a book, Exo Consciousness, Your 21st Century Mind, and it details exo consciousness as a means to awaken and develop an evolved extraterrestrial world view with accompanying advanced abilities. Wright is in Washington, D.C., representative for Quantrek, founded by scientist and Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. This international team of scientists and researchers combine science and spirituality with quantum physics and cosmology. Uh, Quantrek is dedicated to the research and application of, of the quantum hologram and zero-point energy. On the fa uh, faculty of International Metaphysical University, Wright teaches Introduction to Exoconsciousness. And in 2005, she taught one of the first ufology courses in the nation, Extraterrestrial Reality, at Scottsdale Community College right here in Arizona. So I'm just uh, thrilled to have her on the show this evening. Uh, we're going to focus uh, on 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 her quest, which is uh, her research. How does extraterrestrial contact affect human consciousness? It's a very interesting question, and I can't wait to get into this discussion. Uh, welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks, Roxy, and thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. All, all your kind words. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, just off the bat. Um, how did you arrive at this wonderful research that you are involved in? And when did that begin for you? What happened? Did something change for you in your life? 